Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's get this one kicked off with some true or false questions, testing our knowledge of the cardiomyopathies. As always, I'm gonna stick with you here, let you read the question, figure out if it's true or false, and then we'll discuss the correct answer. So let's get started with our first question. So true or false, go. What do you guys think? This is true, okay? Dilated cardiomyopathy is the most common type of cardiomyopathy. And if genetic, it's caused by a mutation of the TTN gene. This encodes the sarcomeric protein called Titan. Now this protein is important because it provides the muscle, the muscle with elasticity, it prevents uh, mus muscular overexhaustion, and allows for post-contraction recovery. In addition to this, the other common causes of dilated cardiomyopathy may include things like drugs, infections like shag, uh, with shagas, uh, or Coxsackie B virus, also ischemia, systemic illnesses, there's a few causes. Now this type of cardiomyopathy will lead to systolic dysfunction and it demonstrates eccentric hypertrophy, which means the sarcomeres are added in series. Now findings associated with dilated cardiomyopathy will include heart failure, an S3 heart sound, systolic regurgitant murmurs, a ballooning appearance on chest x-ray, and dilation on echocardiography. Now we manage this with sodium restriction ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, diuretics, digoxin, mineralocorticoid receptor blockers, and if needed, transplant. Now, since there are many treatment options, you're probably not gonna get a question on the treatment of choice, but rather on the pathophysiology or the, gen the genetics of this condition. So just keep that in mind. All right, next question, true or false, go. This is true. HOCM is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner, and the majority of cases are acquired genetically. Now, the mutation in this condition is to the genes that encode for sarcomeric proteins like myosin binding protein C and beta myosin heavy chain. And this can cause syncope during exercise, or worse yet, its initial presentation can be sudden death. Now, this leads to a diastolic dysfunction, and it's also characterized by concentric hypertrophy, whereby the sarcomeres are added in parallel. The hypertrophy is oftentimes concentrated more so in the septum here, uh, which is something important to keep in mind. Now, what happens here is that if we have asymmetric septal hypertrophy combined with anterior motion of the mitral valve during systole, this causes outflow obstruction, and that's what ends up causing the symptoms. Now, as opposed to dilated cardiomyopathy, this is associated with a S4 heart sound, a systolic murmur, and mitral regurgitation. Now, a patient discovered to have this needs to stop all high-intensity activities and be placed on a, blade, a beta blocker or a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. And because this is genetic and acquired in an autosomal dominant manner, we should test the entire family for this condition. All right, next question. True or false? Go. What do you guys think? Is this true or false? This is false. Remember, dilated cardiomyopathy equals systolic dysfunction. HOCM and restrictive cardiomyopathy equal diastolic dysfunction. All right, next question, true or false, go. What do you guys think? This is false, remember. Dilated cardiomyopathy is characterized by an S3. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is characterized by an S4. All right, one more true false question. True or false? Go. What do you guys think? This is true. Remember, dilated cardiomyopathy displays eccentric, eccentric hypertrophy, meaning the sarcomeres are added in series. While HOCM is characterized by ventricular concentric hypertrophy, this means the sarcomeres are added in parallel. Now, we also need to mention the restrictive slash infiltrative cardiomyopathies. These lead to diastolic dysfunction, just like HOCM. Now, what happens here is all in the name. Something causes the heart tissues to become stiff and restrictive, and the most common causes will include any of the following. Loeffler endocarditis, post-radiation fibrosis, endocardial fibroelastosis, sarcoidosis, hemochromatosis, and or amyloidosis. All right, let's move on to the next question. Multiple choice. Go ahead, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The 
correct answer here is A. So heart failure is obviously a very important topic. So let's do a review of the high yield info we need to know going into exam day. Now you're most likely going to get a clinical scenario thrown your way that describes the common signs and symptoms that are associated with heart failure. So you wanna make sure you know those. So as a reminder, they include fatigue, orthopnea, which is shortness of breath when supine, dyspnea, S3 heart sound, JVD, pitting edema, and rails. If the failure is caused by systolic dysfunction, it is oftentimes secondary to ischemia, MI, or dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, as a result of systolic dysfunction, you're going to see some specific changes in physiology. So if you've got systolic dysfunction, what do you expect to happen to ejection fraction? Well, if you can't get rid of the blood, then it's going to drop, ejection fraction drops. So you'll see a decrease in ejection fraction. This also means end diastolic volume will be increased. Now, if heart failure is precipitated by diastolic dysfunction, what does that mean? It means the heart can't perform the necessary job during the diastolic phase. So we say that compliance of the heart is decreased, which leads to an increase in end diastolic pressure. However, ejection fraction here is preserved. Now, what is the most common cause of right-sided heart failure? Well, that was a, a trick question early on in med school. The most common cause of right-sided heart failure is, of course, left-sided heart failure. If right-sided heart failure is the result of a pulmonary issue, that's known as core pulmonale. Now, certain drugs can help to decrease the mortality associated with heart failure, including ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, and spironolactone. Keep in mind that there's a situation whereby we don't want to use beta blockers in a heart failure patient. What would that special circumstance be? Let's jump to the next question and you'll find out. Go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer is C, beta blockers. Now, while you can give them to a patient with heart failure, you don't want to use them in this specific instance. Now, we can also give loops and thiazides in heart failure, but they don't decrease mortality like the others mentioned, but rather they help with the symptomatic relief. One last pharmacology nugget to share with you here is that we can both improve symptoms and we can improve mortality rates by giving hydralazine with nitrate therapy in select patients who warrant them. Now let's finish up our heart failure discussion by talking about some of the specifics you'll see in right versus left-sided heart failure. With left-sided heart failure, you're more likely to see orthopnea, pulmonary edema, and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Remember that orthopnea is shortness of breath when in the supine position. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is sort of like a breathlessness attack that leads to shortness of breath and coughing, usually waking the person from sleep. Pulmonary edema is going to be another symptom of left-sided heart failure and results from increased pulmonary venous pressure. One of the very high yield facts you must remember about pulmonary edema is that in the lungs, we will find hemosiderin laden macrophages known as HF cells. Okay, that could pop up as a histology question, so don't forget that. Now, in right-sided heart failure, don't forget that just outside the right side of the heart, we've got what? The IVC. This gets backed up into systemic circulation, which is why the main findings of right-sided heart failure have to do with edematous states. For example, JVD, which is a common sign of right-sided heart failure, that's due to an increased venous pressure backing up from the heart. Peripheral edema works the same way. As pressure builds back, there's increased hydro hydrostatic pressure in the vessels. Remember, we talked about this earlier. This forces fluid out of the vasculature and into the surrounding space that causes edema. Increased central venous pressure also affects the liver, whereby there's an increased resistance to portal flow that leads to hepatomegaly, which in this instance is better known as nutmeg liver. All right, let's move on to the next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. The correct answer here is A. So shock is an important topic of discussion because it always seems to pop up on exam day. So let's take a quick look at the different types of shock and the main characteristics of each. So let's start with hypovolemic shock, which you can guess is caused by anything that causes a significant loss of volume from the body. So think of things like dehydration, hemorrhage, anything like that. A vignette will likely tell you that the patient has cold and clammy skin. So watch for that but don't just jump to hypovolemic shock because, shock because obstructive shock and cardiogenic shock could also have that feature. Now, we wanna know what happens to the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, the cardiac output, 
and the afterload in these different types of shock. So in hypovolemic shock, we will see a drop in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and cardiac output, but an increase in afterload. Now, what do you think is the best way to treat this type of shock? Well, since it's caused by a loss of volume, we simply replace that with uh, IV hydration. Now, cardiogenic shock is next. This, as its name implies, can be due to any type of pathology affecting the heart, such as MI, heart failure, etc. In this type of shock, that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure can either go way up or down. So we can't put too much stock in that as a way to differentiate, but you will see a significant drop in cardiac output with this, and you'll see an increase in afterload as well. Now, depending on the problem, we'll treat the heart condition that underlies whatever is causing this problem. Obstructive shock is the third type of shock we need to know, and this can be caused by things like cardiac tamponade, pulmonary embolism, or tension pneumothorax. All of the physiologic changes in this are the same as in cardiogenic shock, except treatment is aimed at resolving that obstruction. Our final type of shock here is, is called distributive shock, also known as vasodilatory shock, and this includes underlying causes like anaphylaxis, shock, CNS injuries, and they lead to vasodilation that decreases blood flow to the major organs. Now, if the cause of shock is anaphylaxis or sepsis, look for warm skin, a drop in PCWP, and a drop in afterload, but an increase in cardiac output. Now, on the other hand, if the underlying cause is a CNS injury, look for dry skin, a drop in PCWP, a drop in cardiac output, and a drop in afterload. And we manage this type of injury with IV fluids, with pressor agents, and epinephrine if the cause is found to be anaphylaxis. All right, let's do one more question, then we will take a break. Go ahead and hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. All right, the correct answer here is E. So what are we dealing with here? What's the condition? Well, we're dealing with cardiac tamponade, which is where the accumulation of fluid around the heart leads to compression, leading to a drop in cardiac output and an equilibration of diastolic pressures in all four chambers. Now, the symptoms described in this vignette are those of Beck's triad, which is hypotension, distended neck veins, and distant heart sounds. Additionally, a patient with tamponade will have tachycardia and pulsus paradoxus, which is characterized by a decrease in the systolic blood pressure's amplitude by more than 10 millimeters of mercury during inspiration. On EKG, I want you to watch out for low voltage QRS complexes and electrical alternands, which is when the QRS complex has an alternating amplitude throughout the EKG. All right, let's take a break. I'll see you guys on the next lecture.